some reason, my invite says it's 726. My phone is dead, and my ID is not in my office. <laughs> so, <laughs> you show, you can see how determined I am to get here. Our student health services directing me to the right spot where you will look it up. I can still be waiting. But, uh, so, this is the first of our brown bag lunch seminars featuring aging related activities by the NYU Aging Incubator Network members, of which we're delighted that Joe is one of our new members. So presenting today is Dr. Joe Ivy Bulger, who is the immediate past president of the New York Academy of Medicine and the president of the International Society for Urban Health. In this past January, Joe became a clinical professor of global public health at the College of Global Public Health at New York University, where she is also a professor of public service health policy and management at the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, and she's a clinical professor of pediatrics. So, Joe is welcome. Thank you. Um, today she's presenting on WHO's age-friendly cities model as implemented by New York State. And we thank you, Linda, for being here. Thank you so much. Here. I thought it might be useful to go around and maybe everyone can give their name and their either the school or organization that they belong to because it sounds like an interesting, interesting, diverse group. You want to start? Uh, I'm Matt Gourmet. I'm a retired physician and uh, academic in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, you're very lucky to be here right yes, now. Yes, right. We escaped. And, uh, <laughs> and we just, it's all right. We're just interested in learning about it. Great. I'm a fellow of Research at NYU, and uh, two of my coworkers just told me about this about 15 minutes ago. It sounds interesting. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Bei Wu. Uh, I'm a faculty at the uh, um, College of Nursing. I'm also one of the co directors for the NYU Aging Incubator. Hi, I'm Victoria Bird. I'm part of the NYU Aging Incubator. And I'm Louise Simon from um, Aging Incubator, also. Howdy, I'm Adam Agata. I'm also an institutional researcher in the one called Rob. And um, I'm also a student at CERN. That's good. That's great. <laughs> I'm Tracy Chippendale, Assistant Professor of Occupational Therapy here at NYU. I'm Mary Middleman. Um, I've been doing research on psychosocial interventions for people with dementia for longer than most of some of you are alive. And, <laughs> and, um, and I direct a family support program funded by New York State to help family caregivers of people with dementia in New York City. And I'm on the steering committee at the AD. <laughs> um, College of um, Dentistry and Global Public Health and uh, Medical Sociologist in New York. So this Klein, um, I just kind of came I'm an alumni at NYU, and I'm looking up different events. I did just going to hear Warren Feldman at the Bronx Playhouse, so I wound up looking at various events, and I'm interested in health, and I'm old, and I thought that this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in more of like older people finding out about the way students do things better, and I did have a family, uh, a background with dementia, so I'm now I'm here, I'm kind of curious, okay. curious person, so I'm good. Hi, I'm Mimi. I'm also part of Lyra, and I was, I'm also coming because I can feel the difference. So, okay, well, excellent. Adam is going to, we're going to recreate that for a <laughs> <laughs> get, the, get this guy's name, you guys. Okay, uh, well, let me start. I'm going to talk to you uh, talk to you about an intervention or an initiative, really, um, that we started when I was president of York Academy. I was there for 10 years. I left in September of 2017 and came here in January of 2018. So, I'm going to describe it from the point of view of sort of day one and some of the some of the results we've had um, in the prod program and also um, leave you with a slide of Lindsay Goldman who is currently the director of Age Friendly and I think some of the incubator leadership are meeting with her next week uh, with Eileen Sullivan Marks who's the dean of um, nursing and um, they're gonna see what we can do to sort of perhaps connect the incubator with Age Friendly going forward. Please come in. <laughs> hey. Sorry, I'm looking for you. Um, all right, so I'm going to sort of stand up so I can see your faces, um, but um, so feel free to stop me at any point. 
Um, I'm going to uh, present this intervention in the context of um, what creates health in a society, which may be a slightly different uh, <coughs> orientation uh, than you may be used to, but also I'll still go through this um, fairly quickly, but stop me if it's too quick. Um, so this is a pretty iconic diagram from some British researchers uh, in 1991. You see things take a long time to penetrate through, but the idea is that you're born with certain uh, traits, certain uh, genetic um, you know, attributions and problems, um, and that you, um, there, the, how your health plays out depends on lifestyle factors you're exposed to, uh, communities you live in, um, community networks that you're part of, and then similarly the kind of policy environment which is around the outside that creates um, the conditions in communities um, for healthy choices. And this is really important because we often talk about um, sort of risk behaviors and behavior change as the essence of improving population health. And we need to be careful about that because many people know what they should do, but they don't have access to the healthy choices because of socioeconomic environment or conditions and availability of fresh fruits and vegetables and safe places to exercise and all the things that we recommend uh, that people do <clears throat> to be healthy. So this is a, a framework is really been used to guide age-friendly work and also uh, something really looking at health across all policies. And this is, if you're gonna look at um, sort of lining up these interventions between the personal ones. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the CDC pyramid, which starts with clinical intervention and then goes down, and you end up with a broad base of policy interventions that has a greater impact on the population. This is a slightly different version of this, and I think the important thing here is that the health sector is only one actor if you're trying to improve um, overall population health. So the health sector, whether it's the healthcare delivery system or the public health, uh, leadership need to begin to make connections with um, people working in housing and urban planning and transportation to give them the evidence base for choices they make all the time, some of which can have more or less impact on health. So if you're the transportation commissioner and you're doing everything you can to get more cars running in New York City, that's a choice you're making around air pollution, potential road traffic accidents, pedestrian fatalities, different from mass transit. Um, and those are huge choices and many countries globally make those choices for billions and billions of dollars. And so part of our, part of the job is sort of beginning those conversations. Urban planning, which is over there, actually started out as a public health field. They are getting back to their roots now, thinking about how you design space in a way that promotes health. So this is, a, this is the basis of our work here. And this, in order to get those sectors to work together, you obviously have to have political so this is something called health and all policies approach, which basically um, is very, this is came to us from the Finns about, again, 20 years ago or so, and really speaks to the importance of political leadership in any policy intervention or any ma major um, systems chain intervention. And the, the essence of this is that all government policies can have an impact on the determinants of health and that um, obviously the impacts are not equally distributed among the population and that in order to be effective, you've got to uh, bring communities into this work. So those are probably fairly familiar to you. So age-friendly New York City uh, is drawn from um, the age-friendly, WHO age-friendly model. This is based on two um, premises. One, fairly transformational thinking that um, uh, healthy, that aging is, healthy aging is what we ought to be focusing on, not on the uh, closing in of mortality. Um, this is a really hard thing for Americans to latch on to because we're completely committed to the fact that we hear the word aging, uh, we're gonna drown Medicare, the social security system is gonna collapse and all these old people are gonna be lying around on the streets or in wherever they may be lying um, and have to be taken care of. And so one of the points of the paradigm shift for WHO was to say we have to promote healthy and active aging. And that still is an issue, and that's kind of what we lead with when we talk about age friendly. Um, and when you think about it, I mean, aging is a public health triumph because people are living longer, right? And that's what public health is all about and what healthcare delivery is all about, is to really have extend people's lives. So the point of, um, of this is to say that 
Uh, we, we think about this as a life course approach. This is pretty familiar to people in pediatrics. We look at you know, prenatal care and then the sort of, sort of addition of um, potential insults and difficulties that one has across the lifespan that may, now we're learning increasingly with um, adverse childhood events that may lead to early onset of chronic diseases later in life. And the point of this diagram is just to say, we're looking, you're born, as we talk about, you're born with a certain set of characteristics. You have a sort of arc of ability to be active and engaged and healthy. Um, and we, and we, this is the disability threshold, and you don't want to fall below that because then your uh, ability to enjoy life and your health status arguably is compromised. So there are two, two ways of dealing with this. One is focusing on the care of the individual person, dealing with their medical issues, dealing with prevention, hopefully, dealing with appropriate medications and others. And the other is to change the environment in which they live so that they can um, reduce the limitations on their activities and mobility, their engagement by changing um, their exposures. So these are the eight domains of age-friendly communities, and this uh, characterization was um, created by sort of individuals from 35 uh, pilot cities in the WHO model, um, and it's led by interviewing older people. This is the other beauty of the age-friendly initiative. It's all led by older people. So if they tell you what makes it harder or easier for them to live in a community and you believe them and you do it, um, it's hard to make a mistake. So this is another really wonderful part of working with this initiative because um, everybody's aging uh, or they're dealing with an aging friend or parent um, and so you don't have to kind of sell, yeah, you should prevent smoking because you know, whatever is bad for you or something. It's, it's one of these inevitabilities. So interestingly, um, the uh, individuals in these 35 cities, the interviews, quality images of older people and their caregivers, actually, in these cities, this is services. One of eight domains they identified as important ones for them. And you see a lot of this importance of social participation, civic participation and activity, and then sort of across information about services available and activities, and then the sort of built and natural environment that can get in the way of their ability to um, engage. So when one uh, begins to develop the age-friendly model, you start by talking to older people in the community, um, and then you begin to fit sort of what they're saying into these domains to tailor it for the particular um, community uh, in, involved. So why in New York? Why would, why would elected officials, as we began this with Michael Bloomberg and his mayor, why would they care about this? Well, this is the big reason. Um, in 2030, there will be, I guess, let me get the numbers right here. Uh, this is the growth of people over 65 in, um, in New York City. You can see the slope of that um, very dramatic increase. Um, and within the next 15 years, there'll be more people over 60 in New York City than school children. Now, this is a wake-up call to an elected official in terms of availability of services and, uh, and the challenges. And um, so you have this number, this is an evidence base for something they should worry about. And then the really important thing for elected officials is showing them where these people are. So we mapped um, the, the where older people live in by councilmanic district in the five boroughs. So the red is where there are over 25% of the residents of that councilmanic district are over 60 and then you see the others. Now, when you present this data to an elected official, of course they go immediately for their district. Um, and one of the things that if you're in public health, you know about also is that the tendency is for uh, poverty, lack of walk space, you know, um, disease burden, et cetera, always overlay in the same communities and you can identify those. And similarly, um, often the case is that aging, um, older people are also often in uh, many of these communities. That's a differential, obviously, not so much on the Upper West Side or other areas or a brief side, but uh, basically, this is um, there, you have to understand, there, there's some interesting issues about availability of walkability and stuff. If you look at the red relative, relative to parks and other things that you could look at. So we mapped all of these assets onto the council and district. And why would this be important to an elected official is because older people 
And um, part of pushing a policy initiative is you really have to understand, uh, give them an evidence base, but also show them why it's a win-win for them to be engaged. These are guiding principles of age-friendly, um, and I think this is the most important ones. Um, older adults are experts on their own lives. And this is really important um, principle relative to linking to the research enterprise and the results of the research enterprise, but the, qual the importance of qualitative information from older people themselves is fundamental to this model. And so you just don't go out and review the literature or decide to do something in Queens um, without talking to people first about it. Um, and then I think some of these, uh, the other point I'll come back to repeatedly here, uh, I talked about the win-win with the electors, right, the, the people vote. But um, the, many of the changes are low cost, no cost. And what happens a lot when we try to make interventions to change systems, we think, oh, you've got to have an extra billion dollars or something. You know, you can't do anything. I mean, healthcare delivery systems must have trouble doing anything without considerable additional money. And so part of the challenge of this is figuring out how to um, use things people are going to do already and think about it through an aging lens, what would the impact? So uh, this is some of the process. Uh, we consulted with over 2,000 adults, thanks to city council members. We had um, hearings in 14 neighborhoods, white languages, 10 immigrant groups, a lot of, uh, did work on people that were home care dependent, did a number of interviews with using with VNS, um, and also developed a website and had people be able to respond, had about 500 individual um, messages. This was part of, part of the, consultation was really um, what makes it harder or easier for you to live in your community and then asking them to comment. Uh, and then um, the other thing to mention is there were expert roundtables. We had business roundtables, we had healthcare delivery, social service experts, geriatricians and others doing their own roundtable and sort of trying to inform the process. And so all of this ended up in this report. Um, which was the kind of findings, we called it findings, not recommendations. We had no recommendations. This was what we found. And the issue was the people that would take the information um, would use it uh, in an applied way. Um, this is a launch. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg launched um, Hit Age Friendly uh, the day of the crash of the uh, Merrill Lynch. Actually, he was running back and forth to his office. Um, and uh, there's a great picture of a 101-year-old woman and her 82-year-old daughter um, together. They were both dressed to the nines and looking really good. Um, and so, um, and then this is the H. Friendly Commission, which was one of the things the mayor appointed a, a formal mayoral commission, which has to be vetted for membership with a public-private partnership with the idea of bringing the private sector into uh, the problem-solving process. This was the first meeting of that group. Um, so let me go through quickly some of the um, issues raised. Uh, this is the first phase, first three years of the program. So transportation, um, anybody, I think anybody, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of things here that are unique to older people navigating the transportation system in Europe. But you begin to, you see the concerns that they had. So what happened in this, um, the 59 commitments that were made was that we met with we were convened by the deputy mayor, then deputy mayor Linda Gibbs, who was deputy mayor for health and human services, convened um, 22 city agencies, and we told them about this initiative. And anybody here who's worked in government knows that the first anxiety, the first reaction is, well, we don't do aging. DIFTA, Department for the Aging, does aging, right? And then the other one says, the next one says, well, you don't, you want my money to, you're gonna take money from me to give to them. And then the third reaction is you're gonna make me spend my money on something I don't wanna spend it on that I don't have. So we, having been in government, I figured that's really the first three questions they would ask. So we immediately disabused them of any of those things and basically asked them the following question. Um, what are you gonna do anyway? What projects do you have afoot in transportation and housing? Uh, what capital investments are you gonna make? Or what um, purchasing, what contracts are you gonna issue in the next three years? And how would you do it differently if you thought about the impact on older people? Sort of like the other sort of through to your grandmother thing, but by the same token, giving them an evidence base for changes in transportation, issues in housing, of opportunities that they could take advantage of. And they got really excited about this. Linda was a brilliant deputy mayor. She developed a sort of matrix and they all went off and 
came back with a set of um, things that were pending and how they would do them differently. So what you're gonna see are some of the examples that came out of these agencies after that process. So this was the transportation issues identified. And these are some of the uh, transportation solutions, fantastic uh, DOT commissioner at the time. These bus shelters, I love this example because older people said they were afraid to sit in bus shelters because they were covered over with paper, there wasn't enough light, and the font was so small they couldn't read the directions. And so in redesigning bus shelters, which are completely paid for by the private sector, by the way, because of advertising, um, this was the design, and you'll also note that they couldn't get up, there wasn't enough seating room, and they had trouble getting up off the benches. So when you go to a bus shelter and take advantage of this pretty nice environment, the only limit now is they haven't, you know, they haven't continued to install all the bus shelters that are needed, but because there isn't room for all of them, but this is, you'll see them around a lot. Um, another really interesting uh, inter interagency activity here was that older people um, needed transportation to go shopping, grocery shopping, and the school buses delivered the kids and sat idle for five hours waiting to pick the kids up. So they mobilized the school buses to, pick, to go to the day centers and all the senior centers and take people shopping and bring them back and then open up the kids. So these are sort of examples of things that are low cost, no cost, um, we're gonna happen anyway that you fix. Um, safe streets for seniors, a lot of the traffic calming activities, um, the, the uh, timekeepers on the lights, these were all things that were in the mind of the transportation commissioner and they were, um, they were put in communities because of the epidemiology, we knew where people were planning to make sure where people live, where there was the highest concentration of older people. So they went in first in those communities. Um, and uh, another area was, was older adults as consumers. Um, the issue of, uh, oh, let me go back to the back just for a minute. This is really, this issue is really important. Older people said, I, I come out of my apartment more if I had a place to sit. But I, you know, if you ever see older people sort of sitting on, fire hydrants are trying to rest. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at those chairs because I know that those are installed on 7th Avenue yeah. and it's a not very congested area. It's almost no people. I mean, it's yeah. really younger people working and going. And I wondered why you don't have these more like on 6th Avenue, you know, where there are more people and yeah. you don't get any place to sit down because they, they are very, very nice. <laughs> they're very nice. Um, they're also can be contested. You know, anything in New York is contested. So people, <laughs> local vendors may not want this there because all those people sit on them. So, I mean, it's not for lack of trying. So where things happen, you can't just go in and put them there. But um, I think there are a lot of good places. They, the people in Coney Island uh, weren't happy because they get hot because the sun beats down on them. These are things you learn along the process. I was noticing that, they, that you have those hand rests yeah. and then you don't, they're not easy for people to lay down where you get yeah. a lot of these people just yeah. laying. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the part of the point of this, but also yeah. helping people get up, yeah. which is one of the issues. Um, so the back to the issue of um, having a place to sit on your way to the store is get you get into this issue of social isolation, which is a huge problem for older people. So if you can get them uh, to come out to know that they can take a rest um, on their way to the store, etc., it really adds to that value. Um, a lot of people's reactions to shopping, uh, a lot of it had to do with the placement of product, um, and also the confusion and the light and the noise and other things. And this is an example of um, uh, moving, you know, trying to, uh, to just a, a sort of busy area of getting, getting access to healthy foods, which is the good news, but the challenging part of moving around. Um, and we started an age-friendly local business initiative, which was an educational campaign, working with small businesses. Again, one thing that's in the business interest is that all people, in addition to voting, they buy local. So they're really important um, uh, sources of, uh, of financial advantage and um, on the Upper West Side, for example, the Apple Store, part of what people in the Upper West Side, they had very different interests from people in East Harlem, the, the folks on the Upper West Side wanted um, to uh, go into the Apple Store to learn how to use computers, but it was too crowded and noisy and they could never get in and they couldn't hear when the person was being taught. So they, the Apple Store opened hours, early hours, twice a week before the store opened so all the people could come in and learn how to do this. And Fairway um, instituted, if you've ever been to Fairway, which I totally went to, um, <laughs> but um, you could call ahead and get um, someone to meet you at the door and take you around Fairway. Wow. Um, this is thanks to um, to uh, our former our Manhattan Borough President, Yale. Which Fairway is that? On the west side. Yeah. Huh. 
Um, this was one of the East Harlem goals. Again, everything's tailored to community and neighborhood. Um, big champion and former uh, city council president. This is a picture of one of the fabulous public pools in East Harlem. Um, you can see what might be a risk for older people um, with the kids <laughs> jumping in and doing splashing. Um, and they said they really wanted to know whether there could be something called senior hours. And this was their um, main uh, interest for, for um, exercise. This was implemented as a pilot in East Harlem one summer. Uh, we got the Parks Department involved early on. They were watching it. They said this looks good to us. We don't know. We did a sort of quick and dirty BMI and activities of daily living, you know, over the course of the summer for these folks who, um, who use this service. And the opening, the ribbon cutting was really interesting. There were about 50 seniors came um, from around the community and many of them said, I haven't been to the school since my kids graduated from college or graduated from high school and left the community. So they were really excited. And this proved to be an organizing place for them. So it started with swimming, uh, but they started meeting regularly um, during the senior hours and got ideas for other community projects. So um, again, this over three years, this became policy for the New York City Health and Park, Parks Department. There's now um, senior hours in all public pools in New York City. So this is an example of how a micro you know, activity can be spread if you bring the commissioners in um, early. They like the, the photo op was great with the pool open, you can imagine it. And I don't want to be cynical, but I've been working with politicians for a long time. Um, so other elements, neighborhood inclusion, most recently, this is a more recent one, but it's indicative of um, injecting the issue of aging, the numbers of older persons, the, some of the age-friendly principles into existing plans. Um, East Harlem developed um, its own neighborhood plan and with, with staff from the New York Academy of Medicine, aging was a consideration there. In addition to health, by the way, which wasn't necessarily going to be included either, but um, Eric Adams has recently uh, declared his commitment to an age-friendly Brooklyn, so there's a lot of work going on there. And this was sort of the impact of the first phase um, of, of results. Biggest, big, really just in the reduction in pedestrian fatalities among older people in these neighborhoods I mentioned, the bus shelters and uh, people touched by the business initiatives. And um, we made it across from uh, Bloomberg to uh, de Blasio um, with a little year's engagement because you have to create your own new commission and unseat the other people and put your people in. Um, and then you've got to get all your agencies together again to come up with new commitments. So this is the de Blasio program, which um, sort of builds on what was done um, by Bloomberg. Um, and then about the same time, we had continued to be talking to state leadership about um, age-friendly New York. This is largely working with ARP, who's been very active, and they are the designee of WHO for declaring um, communities age-friendly um, through their mechanism. And uh, in his State of the State message in 2016, Governor Cuomo uh, announced that he intended for New York State to become uh, an age-friendly state. So now this process is rolling out across the state. This is 2016 to 2018 um, commitments. Again, the age-friendly commission has working groups. Uh, a lot of their working groups resulted in the earlier things you saw. This is the new set of issues. Again, refreshing the interviews with older people in their communities, refreshing the interviews um, and surveys with uh, senior serving organizations. These were the, the issues they identified. Here's some of the results. Um, arts and culture was a big deal. Um, a lot of it had to do with the physical plant of museums, getting in and out, places to sit, etc. And uh, so the academy would do audits, um, senior age-friendly audits of, um, of uh, artistic uh, locations to make sure people could get in. Um, obviously, the SUCASA program is one of the big um, sort of arts engagement programs, um, which deals with a lot of uh, issues on vision, hearing, and reduced rates for activities. And this has uh, been very active. Economic inclusion, another issue that was raised, um, there was a big uh, I've talked about businesses and why businesses should care. We've done a little, we did a little bit of evaluation work on the um, things happening at the cash register for local businesses, which they felt was good enough for them to know that they were doing better if they um, were supportive of older persons coming in. Um, and then uh, I think there was, a, there was a meeting in January uh, earlier this year on financial well-being because there's a lot of concern about fraud, especially with ATM machines and other issues with 
with older people. Um, so this has become a really interesting issue for uh, the banking community. So there's a lot of receptiveness there. Again, looking at the win-win, looking at something they're going to do anyway, and how do you um, address it? Accessible housing. Obviously, this mayor has been very committed to financial accessibility. Along with that, we've been working on um, issues of um, of safety um, and, and uh, adaptability of physical environment. So the Again, the architects and real estate folks have been fabulously responsive in all of this, and the Age Friendly Program sponsored a charrette to look at the three different most common types of housing in New York, you know, the walk-up brownstone and the condominium and others, and looking, they did design on how do we uh, put in, uh, make these more accessible, and obviously you want to avoid falls, you want to avoid risks there, so again, lighting, railing, um, bathroom rails, etc., and there's a guidebook for builders, which um, the city now looks at um, for new building and new zoning. Um, HRLA health systems, uh, we got involved in the healthcare delivery system late because they kind of eat your lunch if you're trying to deal with these some of these broader outside the delivery system mm -hmm. interventions, but um, WHO has an age friendly primary care uh, guide, guidebook. Um, the Hartford Foundation is now very involved in age friendly hospitals. Um, and then and New York State is now is working with Hartford now to look at how to the governor has declared he wants 50 percent of all hospital systems to be age friendly in the next decade, which is going to be a big lift for them. But um, using these guidelines around uh, information, and then the important thing for seniors was a public information campaign to make them aware that you had the right to a free physical as part of um, Medicare, as well as free immunizations for the risk factors, which they weren't using. Um, I have dental colleagues who hope pretty soon you'll be able to say you can get dental care under Medicaid, but that's not an issue. Since there was a dentist here, so um, people working on that. Uh, Data-driven planning. This is a, sort of a brand new um, effort to take the health department's ability to really look now at sub um, zip code uh, neighborhoods. They've done this fabulous new set of analytics, and this working with the CUNY Graduate Center on the Academy um, helped develop uh, the uh, look at neighborhoods and looking at their characteristics, the, um, the, uh, res the, in the residents of older people and some of the factors that are concerns of age friendly in that map. This is now for all, all of New York City and there seems to be interest in the State Department for the Aging to, um, to extend it to New York State. It's only a matter of funding. Uh, paradigm shift, we talked about this, getting the conversation going about changing the environment, not just treatment models for older people. Um, and this is sort of a lessons learned um, from the work. Uh, and this might be for any um, public health intervention, but um, it's something that's very important. First is that uh, changing the environment may be more effective than efforts to change individual behavior. You obviously need a combination of both. But it's surprising when you have a conversation with people. Many people do know what the healthy behavior is, but they can't act on it. They don't have the money, they don't have the services there, they don't have the access. Um, and many people don't know about them either. They don't know about services, and this was a big complaint of older persons. Um, the win-win solutions we talked about and the co-benefits. So if you're a transportation commissioner and you're putting in these things anyway, you can have a positive impact on older people. Um, you see this even more on the health case for something called the Fleet 3, so we have the bike lanes and the pedestrians, and I know everybody's, and now we have to walk, worry about the bikes instead of the taxis, but at any rate, eventually, <laughs> uh, the idea is active uh, transportation to, for weight control. Um, low cost and no cost interventions, what are you gonna do anyway? That you could do differently if you had an evidence base for what promotes aging, uh, healthy aging, um, and then the political support. I mentioned uh, we, the first term, second term of Bloomberg was he started this, and then he ran for office. We had really good support from the speaker of the city council as well, and then she decided she might run for mayor. So we had a really tough year there trying to figure out. Nobody wanted to support somebody else's initiative, and we had to rebrand everything. Um, but we made it through, and then we had an election. So again, you had to start, you know, we, we tried to build it into the mayor's management report under Bloomberg, so it would be part of the operating statistics that were gathered, but again, it's kind of, okay, new people on the block, here's the argument, look what's going on, this is great. And a lot of the advocacy groups were really important, um, the aging advocacy groups in this effort. 
Um, financial resources, you're not going to get much out of the healthcare system, I think. Uh, it's pretty tight, but um, there's a lot of, lot of money in transportation, a lot of money in housing, or money in urban planning, and again, it's how do they use it that can be helpful to you. Uh, and then, you know, engagement, conversation, and um, with the public, uh, with people affected, and then uh, the broader partnerships like I showed you in the data activity. Government doesn't do it alone. It's a classic line we try to remind ourselves in public health that government doesn't do it alone. You have to work with other partners. So this is uh, the beauty, of, I think, of this initiative that's set up like that. So that's it. This is Lindsay. Um, and, uh, you know, please get in touch with her. I'm going to next year. She'll have her come here and tell you. <coughs> Yes. I have a question. Are the older adults who I talk to, even the caregivers in the family support program who are already burdened by being care for people with dementia, talk about volunteering all the time. There are people, many of them, who have worked all their lives and aren't working anymore and would really like to make a contribution. And there aren't a lot of easy connections for people who would like to volunteer their time that, that I know of where they could go and say, I'm really good at this, and so this is what, I mean, I think you could get a lot of, both a lot of benefit for the older adults and a benefit for the other people around them if people could volunteer their skills, their time, and, and in a way that was organized so that they had a place to go to do it, yeah. or a place to call when they, and, and a public, campaign so they would know that you yeah. There's an organization called Reserve. I know. Which we work with. They've been really, really active in this program from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's the only response like, I I think yeah. you're right. Well, this is theme is limited, very though. I mean there are millions of older adults who well, are yeah, that's right. something. Yeah. Right. And I mean the problem is as you say you've got you want it to be organized because you don't want to waste their time and you have to be sure they're going to be welcome with the organization they work well, with. But it doesn't always have to be organizations. It could be you know like Jerome yeah. sends young people to help old people on the upper yeah. west side. Yeah. They could yeah. be sending old people to help. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely a theme as part of this. If Lindsay were here, she could probably give you more details. But I mean, it's definitely a theme. It's not something that maybe doesn't come up a lot. And the intergenerational issues are also part of that conversation. Yeah. Different communities have, have different uh, age ranges when it comes to talking about seniors. Perhaps I missed it, but what age range are we talking about when we refer to seniors in age-friendly communities? It's generally, I would say, 60 to 65, uh, and then obviously it goes up till um, you know you're not here anymore. So I mean, they're they're I mean now we're counting people between 65 and 70, 70, 75, 75. I mean they're counting these cohorts because people are living much longer. So it starts at so there's 60 to 65 um, the attention, but I mean 